off. Yeah. So this week's um, OpenShift Commons, we're really happy to have Abhishek Gupta from the OpenShift engineering team. And it's uh, definitely a V3 topic. Um, we're going to talk about scheduling pods for high availability, and he's going to do a, a bit of a deep dive and then a little bit of a demo afterwards, and then we'll do some Q&A. And this week, the recording appears to be working. So um, we're going to uh, cross our fingers, and then hopefully the demo will work too at the end of this. So um, take it off, um, Abhishek. And... All right. Thanks, Diane. So uh, my name is Abhishek Gupta, and I am on the OpenShift engineering team. And uh, today we are going to talk about the scheduler within OpenShift v3. And for uh, you know those of you who have been following uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift development uh, on the v3 uh, version uh, from the beginning, uh, the scheduler that we have is pretty much working on a three-step process. So talking about the scheduler overview, uh, the first step of uh, the scheduler is to take the list of the entire nodes in the system that are available and are schedulable and filter out the ones that do not fit the requirements for the pod. So the requirements that a pod could state could be things like, you know, uh, certain hosts, uh, certain uh, ports are required, certain disk volumes are required, or certain resources are required, so things like that. So some basic uh, uh, filtering out of the nodes that don't fit the requirements of the pod, uh, those are taken into consideration. In the second step, the filtered nodes are now prioritized uh, to find uh, you know, the best fit. And each priority function uh, gives a score of uh, between 0 to 10 to each of these nodes. And they can also assign a weight to a priority function. So, the way uh, this works is you can have multiple priority functions and we're going to talk about you know predicate functions for filtering and priority functions for the prioritization uh, a little bit later in detail but uh, the priority functions give a weight of uh, you know 0 to 10 and you can assign a weight to uh, balance your uh, prioritization algorithm a little better and have granular control over it finally uh, once you have your prioritized list of uh, nodes uh, you just select uh, the best fit, you know, the ones which have the highest score. And if you have multiple of those, you just select the, uh, you know, uh, one at random from that list. So uh, let's talk about the predicate functions in details. These are the ones that are the filter mechanisms for filtering out the nodes that do not fit the pod requirements. And uh, you can specify multiple of these. Uh, each predicate functions deal with a specific, uh, you know, constraint or requirement or, a, uh, you know, uh, conditions that is specified as part of the scheduler configuration. And each node has to pass through all of these predicate functions in order to be considered a fit for scheduling a given pod. So, taking a look at some of the available predicate functions that come out of the box with the uh, OpenShift. The first one is the pod fits ports. And this one ensures that if you specify your host port uh, conditions, if you require a host port uh, in your pod, that we will not schedule multiple pods that require the same port on the host. So as far as, you know, you can specify any port within the pod itself, but if you require that port to be mapped onto the host, then we will make sure that multiple pods don't conflict on the port requirements. Uh, second, we have uh, pod fits resources, and this one, uh, you know, takes care of uh, the requirement that the pod specifies for uh, various resources, uh, namely uh, CPU and memory. So a pod could specify requirements for CPU and memory, and we will make sure that those can be satisfied by the node in question based on available remaining capacity uh, discounting the resources that are already consumed by the pods that are already hosted on that particular node. Uh, moving down, uh, we have uh, the match node selector, which is just a way for uh, users to specify or have a granular control over uh, which nodes they want the pod to be uh, hosted on. So within the pod spec itself, you can specify a node selector, and this is essentially a label selector that identifies a target set of nodes and your pod will be 
hosted on one of those uh, nodes that match the particular node selector. If you want even greater control, uh, you have the host name predicate where you can specify the exact host name and your pod will be scheduled on that particular host itself, uh, assuming obviously that uh, you know the other predicates uh, do uh, seem to pass that node as a good fit. And finally, uh, we have the service affinity, which is of uh, especially interest to us uh, today uh, with regards to our HA discussion. And uh, this is the predicate that ensures that uh, you know all pods that belong to the same service are hosted on a given uh, set of nodes that are identified uh, by the configuration for this predicate. And we'll go into the details of this one a little bit later. Uh, now coming on to the priority functions, and these are the ones that uh, come into play in the second step, in the second phase of the scheduler functioning. These are the ones that determine the relative suitability of the uh, to host the pod for a given node. And uh, as we've mentioned, uh, each priority functions can assign a score of 0 to 10 to each node. You can further uh, refine your policy by specifying or allocating a weight to a particular priority function in order to give you know greater importance to a particular uh, algorithm and uh, deprioritizing a different algorithm while not removing it completely uh, multiple priority functions can obviously be specified and uh, the scores that all of these give to the nodes are then aggregated the weighted scores are aggregated and uh, that is how you get the final scores for each of the nodes to host a given pod. Some of the available priority functions that we have in the system today out of the box are the least requested priority and this one uh, favors the nodes where fewer resources are requested. Now what that means is if you have pods already hosted on that on a particular minion, those pods we will calculate the resources that have already been requested and hence deemed consumed by the pods that are on a given node. And then we will make sure that uh, we will prioritize the nodes that have more or greater available capacity, uh, you know, and deprioritize the ones that have, uh, you know, uh, low available capacity and things like that. And obviously, uh, as a side note, pods do need to specify the resource requirements. So, I mean, it's not, uh, it's not necessary for a pod to specify their CPU and memory requirements, but for this particular uh, priority function to have any meaningful impact, the pods need to specify that. Uh, the second one down is uh, service spreading priority. And uh, what this does is it ensures that there is a good spread of the pods that belong to the same service among the available nodes uh, within uh, the system. And again, the nodes, uh, when we talk about, we are talking about the filtered nodes uh, that have passed through the first phase. Uh, if we were to take this concept a little further, we have the service anti-affinity. And what this one ensures is that there is a good spread of the pods belong to the same service across a certain group of nodes. Now, while the previous one just spread it across all nodes, this one would identify you know, individual groups of nodes and spread it among the different groups as identified by uh, label selectors. And we'll go into the details of uh, this particular priority function in detail when we talk about uh, HA. So looking at some of the HA requirements, uh, actually taking a quick step back in 2.x, uh, if some of you have followed uh, the scheduling algorithms in OpenShift 2.x, uh, over there, we have a similar concept with the regions and zones, but those are a little prescriptive. Uh, we force you essentially in, uh, to uh, categorize your nodes within certain uh, regions and zones. And while those functionalities are you know, really helpful in achieving a good spread and HA, uh, our current focus within uh, OpenShift 3 and the design for that you know, we aim to be a little more flexible. So having said that, uh, let's look at some of the requirements that we, uh, you know, began with, uh, with regards to HA for the scheduler. So we wanted to have uh, the ability to define multiple infrastructure levels. 
So infrastructure levels are, you know, things like your zones, racks, power bars, and uh, things like that. Uh, these are completely flexible as such, and uh, you can have multiple of these levels which can be nested. Uh, secondly, we wanted the ability uh, to restrict all pods belonging to a particular service within a particular infrastructure level. So what that means is if my uh, you know, pods or if my application has uh, you know, low latency requirements, I definitely don't want them to span uh, great regions and uh, great distances and would want them to be co-located in a, uh, you know, within the same rack or the same zone or things like that. And that is something that we wanted the ability to have and be able to specify that at uh, any level or at multiple levels. Uh, spreading the zones within a given uh, service among the particular set of nodes. So this is the crux of uh, uh, anti-affinity or uh, having a good spread at a certain level. So let's say I want all of my service pods within the zone to be spread across all the available racks. This is the priority function that uh, uh, we'd be using and that is you know, one of the requirements that you could specify a good spread at, again, multiple levels. Yeah, this, so now talking about the infrastructure topology in a, a bit of a detail. Like I said, we've made this fairly flexible because that administrators can define multiple levels and uh, you know these could be uh, any levels really. So, as examples, uh, you could have uh, zone, racks, power bars, and the way we have allowed uh, administrators to define this is by the use of labels on the nodes. So you can have simple labels be specified on the nodes, you know, as uh, for example, zone equals Z1, rack equals R1, power equals power bar equals uh, V1, and that is essentially what uh, will be picked up and uh, considered by the scheduler in terms of uh, infrastructure topology levels. Uh, level names and the number of levels are uh, completely flexible, so there is no uh, fixed uh, specification on what names you want to give your levels or how many levels you want to have. So you're completely free to specify something like, you know, city, building, server room, racks, and any of those things as your labels. Uh, finally, uh, levels are usually nested and you know that that is something that uh, has uh, been sufficient but that is not being uh, built in as a requirement so you can have orthogonal uh, uh, sets of uh, your uh, node clusters for example you could have a prod dev test as uh, one set of categorization and you could have an orthogonal set that is zone and rack you know, assuming that uh, zone could have uh, uh, nodes from both prod, dev, and test, and things like that. It depends upon the requirement. Uh, there could be use cases uh, that uh, would benefit from this. So the next thing that we wanted to talk about was service affinity. So this is uh, what ensures that multiple pods within the same service or all the pods within the same service end up being uh, created or hosted on minions within the same topological level. Uh, again, topological level, if uh, it's a zone and you define your affinity at a zone, uh, you could essentially uh, ensure that all your nodes within the service end up within the same zone on different uh, nodes, obviously, but within the same zone. And uh, the way to do this would be simply to configure your service affinity predicate in the scheduler configuration by specifying a label. And the label is the same that we have used uh, on the node to define uh, the particular level. So as an example, uh, I have in here a zone affinity uh, which uh, takes in a label of uh, uh, zone and would, you know, one, if, if your scheduler is configured with this particular priority function, you would uh, ensure that all the pods within a given service are co-located within the same zone. 
Now, uh, multiple levels can be specified for affinity as well. So you could perhaps, you know, in, if you have multiple levels, you could want uh, affinity at multiple levels. So if you have really high latency, you know, this would be one thing to uh, uh, perhaps use and you could specify multiple levels. So in the example that we have in here, where we are defining affinity at the zone and the rack level, you would have essentially all the pods within the same service uh, co-located not only within the same zone, but also within the same rack. They will be distributed uh, on the different nodes within uh, the same rack, but uh, all of them will be within the same rack. Uh, next one is uh, anti-affinity that we uh, wanted to uh, talk about. And this is the one that finally ensures a good spread of your pods and you know, becomes the crux of uh, the highly available uh, functionality of the scheduler. This ensures that the pods within your service are spread across uh, different nodes uh, across a certain topological level. So let's say you define a scheduler configuration, which says that I want a good spread across the different racks within my zone. So you would uh, so, uh, so you would define your uh, priority function and provide a label of uh, rack. And again, this is the uh, label that the minions have. And the scheduler will ensure that uh, as new pods come in, a good spread is ensured within the different racks that are uh, you know available within that particular zone. Uh, so the way this does is, is the priority function gives the same score to all nodes within the same group. So this ensures that if a pod already exists within uh, you know, one node in a particular rack, that all the nodes within that particular rack will be given the same score and the nodes within another rack, which do not have uh, any pods in them, uh, are given uh, a higher score and hence, uh, the nodes within the other rack will be, you know, essentially prioritized over all the ones in the rack where a pod does already exist for that service. And uh, so, next one uh, is uh, the scheduler policy configuration. So in here we have uh, two things. So first of all, we have the default configuration. Uh, that comes out of the box in which you do not have to do anything. And we have uh, the uh, priority functions and the predicates predefined for you. Uh, they do not have the affinity and anti-affinity predicate and priority functions in there, but for most basic purposes, uh, conflicts and uh, constraints, all of those things are taken care of by the default policy configuration. However, if you were to specify custom uh, policy for your scheduler, you can do a mix and match of the different uh, available predicates and priority functions and specify a configuration file and uh, you know, uh, specify that within the master configuration in OpenShift. So over here we have you know, a snippet of an example of a policy file. It is versioned, so as we you know, make changes or to the structure of the file, we will uh, hopefully ensure uh, backwards compatibility and conversions and things like that. So in this example, uh, I have added uh, two predicates, uh, the pods with resources, and uh, I am defining affinity at the zone level. And as far as my priorities are concerned, I am uh, ensuring that a good spread as far as resources being consumed for my nodes is uh, ensured by using the least requested priority. And I am uh, specifying a spread at the rack and the power bar level. So to take uh, now an example of what happens when you have these priority functions defined, uh, let's look at a case where we have uh, defined affinity at the zone level and anti-affinity at the rack and the power bar level. So over here in the chart, we have two zones defined. Uh, you know, the top zone has uh, 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 12 uh, 
uh, nodes and the lower zone Z2 has uh, again an, an, another 12 nodes. Within each zone we have uh, three different racks and within each rack we have uh, two different power bars and each power bar has uh, two nodes. So now what happens when a pod belonging to a service uh, comes in? Since the pod does not have any other uh, requirements specified on a particular region or, or, or on, a, on a particular zone or a, a host uh, or a node, the scheduler will just host it or schedule it on any available node within the cluster. So let's say in this case it gets hosted or scheduled on a, a node within uh, the Z2 zone within rack R22 and uh, you know uh, one of the power bars within that. So now once this one uh, you know fits into any particular uh, zone what happens if new pods are then created for this particular service. So let's say we create five more pods. So now that we see that new pods coming in the affinity policy at the zone level will ensure that all the new pods will end up being scheduled onto the same zone. So all the zone or all the new pods uh, end up getting scheduled on uh, the minions within Z2. In terms of uh, anti-affinity, now we have uh, configured a good spread at the rack and the power bar level. And this ensures that, uh, you know, the second uh, pod coming in, uh, which is uh, P1, uh, uh, or P2S1 goes on to rack R21, the third pod goes on to the third rack, and then, you know, as new pods uh, keep coming in, uh, they are added on to uh, different racks within the same, uh, or sorry, different power bars within the same rack, and uh, so on and so forth. So eventually, uh, if you have six, you will ensure that each power bar within each rack has one pod. If you go on to now add more pods, you will get duplication or essentially uh, you know more pods multiple pods within the same power bar but even then we will try to add it to different nodes within the power bar to have as good a spread as possible at that level uh, now finally before moving on to the demo portion of it uh, just wanted to make a, a, a quick word about the uh, Scheduler extensibility uh, aspects. So, just as anything within uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes, we follow a general model of uh, pluggability, such that uh, you know things uh, are based on a plugin model. So, having said that, there are you know essentially two ways to extend uh, and enhance the functionality of the scheduler. The first and uh, foremost, current scheduler implementation is definitely extensible and configurable. And the way to extend it would be to add new uh, predicate and priority functions uh, in order to, uh, you know, be able to deal with more resource, more constraints, and as well as to enhance the prioritization algorithm. And that, you know, in addition to the available predicates and priority functions and new ones that can be created, the scheduler can deal with. Uh, most use cases uh, reasonably well. If, however, you want, you know, far greater uh, functionality and features, which, uh, you know, sort of cannot be fit within the model of the current scheduler implementation, then uh, the entire scheduler itself is uh, built on a plugin model, and uh, the current implementation is a plugin within that particular model, and uh, other schedulers can easily be plugged in uh, and integrated with the. Uh, uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift. So uh, now, uh, having said that, uh, I'll move on to the demo portion of it. Uh, did we want to take uh, questions uh, after the demo, uh, Diane, or uh, before well, that? There's one from Luke right now, and um, you may have answered it for him. I'm just going to un unmute mute. He unmutes himself. Luke Meyer. Sure, whether it's still it's about um, cross-service affinity. Um, if, when he doesn't want his front-end pods and database pods to be in different regions, maybe a label affinity instead of a service affinity. Is there such a thing? Or maybe Luke, you can add to that conversation. 
if you unmute yourself. So uh, if I uh, understood the question correctly, we are talking about uh, cross-service uh, uh, anti-affinity, I uh, presume. And one way to do that would be to just specify, you know, different uh, regions within your pod itself or your replication controller and things like that. And that itself will ensure that uh, the pods uh, for your different services end up on different uh, you know, uh, different uh, levels or uh, you have a good spread uh, among them. But out of the box, uh, as far as the scheduler configuration is uh, concerned, we currently do not have a direct mechanism where you can uh, link multiple services and uh, define uh, anti-affinity uh, among them. So that would be, you know, uh, typically an example of how you would uh, go about doing something like this. So today, uh, just to talk about this, uh, uh, you know, a bit further, we have these affinity and anti-affinity defined at the service level. Uh, there would be, you know, uh, it would be pretty easy to define an anti-affinity priority function that works at a project level or a namespace level and can ensure a good spread not only of the service pods but also of the pods you know belonging to different service now whether you want affinity for that or anti-affinity both of those things would be possible uh, by simply writing a new predicate or a priority function okay so there's a couple of questions i've unmuted everybody so hopefully luke you can ask this second one that you've just follow on us about um when you say the sch scheduler functions and the schedule itself are pluggable does this require require recompiling yeah. or reconfiguring? Go for it, Luke. Did I get that right, Luke? The question? Uh, let me just uh, scroll up. Uh, yeah, go on to the side here. You can see some of these. So, uh, is it down the top? All the way down the bottom. The very, very bottom. There's three questions at the bottom. Okay, so when you say scheduler yeah. functions and the scheduler itself are pluggable, this requires recompiling or reconfiguring? Um, you need to convince them about vision and how they're going to be part of making that vision a reality versus so if, very someone, just if someone is speaking it's very faint uh can barely yeah. hear the person we need, to buy in, or we need to retain the talent by giving them the right incentive which i'm sure Phil and Divya can help us with that as long as we can get them on board but i other. think so. oops Sorry, if, sorry about that, Abhishek. I, I muted somebody who was having a conversation in the background. Right, no, not a problem. So uh, to answer the uh, first question, or you know, uh, in the ones that I'm looking at right now, uh, the answer is both. If you want to have uh, uh, a different scheduler configuration based off of existing available predicates and priority functions then that is something that is a matter of uh, merely reconfiguring the scheduler policy and restarting the scheduler. Uh, if you were to add new uh, scheduler predicates and uh, priority functions, then that would be something that would uh, definitely require compiling of those uh, predicates and priority functions. And uh, then obviously uh, reconfiguring the scheduler policy uh, file to incorporate those. Uh, as far as completely ripping out and replacing the scheduler, you would, you know, obviously just stop the scheduler and uh, provide your own, and that does not necessarily, uh, you know, need anything to be done on the OpenShift side of things because the scheduler, the way it works is it watches, it, it, it consumes the master APIs to watch for any new pods coming into the system and you know uses other data from the master and uh, you know does the processing and finally uh, for as far as you know scheduling the cons is concerned it uh, again makes an api to uh, create the binding uh, for the particular pod so ryan you want to try and um, ask your question now and see if we can get some unmute yourself Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yep. I can. 
<laughs> All right. So, yeah, I was wondering, um, I, I missed a couple parts of the discussion earlier, but I didn't hear anything about um, deployment strategies. And I was wondering if you had any kind of quick comments on how that might relate to this discussion. So deployment strategies, if you are talking about, uh, you know, the ones that uh, we refer to as deployment strategies within OpenShift itself, then what that is, is just defining how your pods for a given service, you know, get spun up. So if you were to have a, a deployment strategy of, uh, you know, rolling deploy, for example, then, you know, if you were to make changes to an, the underlying image for your pods, then a new deployment is created and all your existing pods will be, you know, uh, tear, torn down and new pods will be created. And then the deployment strategy uh, really refers to how that transition takes place, whether it's a tear down and recreate, whether it's a rolling deployment, you know, one of them is torn down, a new one is added, or it's an uh, AB uh, deployment where both are stood up and then, uh, you know, switched over, things like that. So if that is what you meant, uh, when talking about the deployment strategy that yeah, is yeah. Really a, okay so then that is really an orthogonal uh, concern as far as the scheduler is concerned because when you talk about the deployment strategy it only ess essentially you know dictates how new pods get created and how old pods get turned down but where the scheduler comes in is and uh, trying to figure out where new pods get scheduled and over here, there might be a little overlap where you would potentially want new pods to be created either on the same nodes or similar nodes or similar groups or on different nodes than the outgoing ones. And those are things that uh, you can have, you know, essentially some control over uh, with regards to the scheduler configuration. And that goes on to uh, the question of how you define your application controllers for the uh, deployment strategy. Uh, what services are being used, whether the service is uh, handling both the set of outgoing and incoming uh, pods and things like that. But but mostly for the most part, these are two orthogonal concerns. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, just looking at the next one, were deployments mentioned earlier and could comments on how those strategies? Yep, we went through that. Uh, yes, I'm curious about how pods can be rebalanced. If a policy is updated with new predicates, will it check to rebalance pod or would it only affect new pods? Uh, yes, the latter. Uh, as of now, there is no automatic uh, rebalancing, but uh, rather when new pods come in, they will follow the new policy and uh, you know ensure a good spread. If so, if you were to somehow simulate uh, rebalancing, you could simply, if you have a replication controller assuming, you could simply uh, tear down a couple of pods and uh, those will be recreated and the new ones coming in. Uh, to satisfy the replica count requirement of the uh, reso uh, of the replication controller, the new pods will now follow the new uh, scheduling policies. So why don't we um, switch over to to the demo there? Um, all right. In the interest of time, and then we'll ask any Q and A at the end of the demo. Sure. So what I have over here is. Uh, you know, a bunch of nodes that I have created for this demo, and uh, well, it's a, it's it's a, oops, yeah, it's a long list as such, but uh, I have managed to create uh, 81 uh, nodes uh, in my cluster over here, and uh, the way I've done it is I have defined three levels, uh, a zone, a rack, and a power bar, and uh, as you can see. My nodes are labeled with zone Z1, Z2, and Z3, and my you know racks similarly are labeled as uh, you know all of those uh, labels and uh, similar. Same goes for the uh, power bars, and they move from uh, you know uh, zones and racks and power bars from uh, the first minion to the last, just so it's easy to track. So we have three zones. Each zone has uh, three racks. Each rack has three power bars and each power bar has uh, three nodes. So that's how we have a final of uh, 81 uh, nodes within the cluster. So uh, taking a quick look at uh, the service. Uh, first off, I'm going to create a service. 
that a label selector for of uh, uh, front end. So if you look at this particular one, we have a front end service where the label is a uh, name equals hello OpenShift or uh, whether and uh, the selector is uh, uh, name equals front end. So with this uh, service in place, now I'm going to create a replication controller and Initially, that replication controller has, uh, I believe, a single. Oops, let's change that. I'm going to start with a single replica for my replication controller to see how that, uh, you know, uh, gets impacted by the scaling policy, and we'll increase the replica uh, count as uh, we progress in the demo. So. First off, we create this replication controller and as we check the pods, we see that a single pod is created and it is hosted on minion 8. So essentially, uh, we have this being now created in the first zone. Uh, to take a very quick look at the scheduler policy that we have, we have defined Affinity at the zone level and a spread at the rack and the power bar level. And finally, we have also, for good measure, just spread, uh, just use the service spreading priority, uh, which ensures a good spread among all minions. With this in place, now we are going to go ahead and modify our replica count within the replication controller to now three. So this essentially we are trying to ensure that the three pods that get created do end up getting uh, created on the three different racks within the system. If we take a look at the pods in a couple of seconds, so we see that uh, you know all of the pods are created on uh, uh, minions 10, 8, and 24, and you know all the way from 1 to 27 would be nodes within the same zone, and these are all on different racks. If we were to you know further go ahead and uh, just uh, change that to 9, the objective over here is to try and figure out. Uh, or to verify that there is a good spread of these pods across the different power bars now. So taking a look at the pods now, a couple of them still remain unassigned and uh, we see that, well, if you were to take a look at the labels on these minions, we'd see that uh, each one of them as you can see, they're you know sufficiently well spaced out in terms of numbers. Each of them uh, is actually hosted on a particular power bar. Uh, finally, uh, if we were to just you know go full out and uh, create 27 replicas, so we'll have 27 pods. Objective is to you know see that we've ensured a good spread of uh, these pods on uh, all of the available nodes within that particular zone. So what we have done over here is now modify the replica count to 27. And if we now look at the different pods, uh, well, it's hard to see over here, but uh, if we just were to sort out the specific uh, nodes, that the different pods are assigned to, we can see that uh, you know there is one pod on every node. Now, if you further increase the number of pods within your service, uh, you will get duplication. But even the new ones coming in, we will ensure that uh, you know if you add three more, they will get added to uh, one uh, of each of the uh, racks and so on and so forth. So essentially, you know HA is achieved by ensuring a good enough spread across the levels uh, that you have uh, configured your scheduler policy to have anti-affinity against. 
that was the uh, sort of the demo. One thing that I would like to uh, mention before we open up the forum for additional questions is that while the system, uh, the current implementation is completely flexible in terms of you know how you can define your topological levels and where you can define your affinity and anti-affinity requirements. Uh, we would definitely like to mention that uh, a lot of this has to be a balancing act between HA requirements on one side and latency requirements on the other hand. So if you you know were to go ahead and specify uh, anti-affinity at the zone level, uh, your pods for your service will actually get spread across the different zones, but it is up to the application developer and you know the deployer to uh, you know realize that whether that service, whether the pods, whether that application can actually handle the level of latency that would uh, come with spreading at that level. So, you know, I mean, you can have the highest level of uh, HA by having it spread across zones, but, uh, you know, other considerations like uh, latency for your application and things like that would also govern uh, how you would want to define your uh, scheduler policies. So All right. With and with that, I'm going to unmute everybody and let's see if there are any questions. Um, in order to ask a question, you can either throw it into chat or unmute yourself and just vocalize that question today. It looks like that's working. As long as Luke turns on his microphone. All right, so let's see. And this, I think. If nodes drop, do pods get relocated? So that is a different mechanism. Short answer, uh, yes, that is a functionality that we're working on. And, uh, you know, you will have the ability if nodes drop, if nodes are no longer available, that uh, pods will be recreated. Uh, there is also a mechanism that, again, we are building where uh, preemptive evacuation of nodes is uh, being worked upon. So either nodes are already dead and the pods are already lost and we want to recreate them. Uh, that is being handled or being worked upon. And secondly, uh, preemptive evacuation of uh, pods from a node. That is also uh, something that is being handled. And uh, in either cases, you will bring the scheduler into play and the pods that were created on a particular you know node that has either gone dead or uh, is being evacuated all those pods will be recreated afresh and the scheduler will then decide where a best fit for those pods are and uh, schedule them on those uh, particular nodes uh, so is the mic still ongoing the mics are Sorry. working fine Go for it, Brian. Ask your question. Is that uh, is that work still ongoing at this time? The uh, evacuation and the uh, identification of failed nodes. I believe so. Uh, that is actually something that uh, you know uh, folks from another team, uh, John Hans and uh, Ravi, are looking at. But if you have specific questions, uh, feel free to reach out on the list and. Uh, uh, I can point you to the particular Trello cards and uh, any, uh, you know, current uh, progress and things like that. But that is uh, definitely uh, something that is uh, in progress, yes. I'm familiar with Boundary. Right, there's, a, there's a guest who's just asked another question, Abhishek. Alrighty, so could we get an admin tool that could show us which pods could be better balanced? Uh, so, yes, <laughs> ideally, uh, while we don't have that right now, obviously, but uh, a simple tool to figure out, uh, you know, given the number of pods within the system, if you were to delete them today and recreate them, where would they end up going? You know, that could be compared to where they are right now. And perhaps, you know, that is the comparison that uh, would be required and, you know, could pretty much be a dry run of uh, recreate or redeploy my, uh, you know, service pods so yes can be done uh, would be interesting uh, but having said that there is nothing preventing you from actually going ahead and doing that by 
simply uh, modifying your deployment config or updating your deployment config. So if you, you know, have your pods and services and replication controllers all managed and controlled by a deployment config, uh, merely updating the deployment config or the version itself will ensure that all your pods are recreated anew and well, the new pods will get uh, balanced based on current scheduler policies and available nodes and best fits. And as, as Mike mentioned, uh, some of that work is the visualization side of it is being um, looked at by the Manage IQ team. Um, All right, that's interesting. I mean, uh, we could, uh, you know, definitely uh, pass this particular, uh, you know, thought or uh, requirement uh, by them because it does seem interesting. All right. Yep, Brenton, uh, sure. I mean, you know, just a dry run, like I said, of uh, uh, how a new deployment would uh, manifest itself uh, would be a simple way to go about it. But yeah, cool. There's also a few companies involved in looking at visualizing the Kubernetes cluster. All right, good to know. All right, uh, well, if there are any other questions there, the mics are open. If not, um, really, Abhishek, thank you very much for your time today. This was great um, and gave some good insight. And I think it cries out for some visualization. So maybe we'll get the Manage IQ guys um, and onto the uh, onto this and uh, get them to demo something for us soon. So thanks again, and um, we'll be back again next week. And All right, take that's care good. And, and finally, you know, I mean, uh, some last words uh, is. Uh, We've looked at uh, the scheduler and its extensibility uh, capabilities and, uh, you know, uh, definitely would encourage folks to try it out, uh, play with the scheduler configuration, you know, uh, try out your different use cases and would love contributions on new predicates and priority functions, uh, as well as any uh, integrations for your own schedulers uh, that you guys uh, might have. So uh, any of those things, uh, new predicates and priority functions for extending the current functionality are greatly welcome. So we are, as we speak, already working on adding new uh, uh, capabilities to the existing scheduler, and uh, you know, it will only get better with time. Yeah, and I, I think the other interesting thing is that the Mesospheres folks just joined the OpenShift Commons, so I'm thinking Mesos as a scheduler might have some resources to do some alternatives. Yep. To De definitely. I mean, Mesos as a, a scheduler plugin, uh, even Yarn as a scheduler plugin uh, candidate. I mean, those things, you know, which are, you know, really uh, fully featured and uh, uh, highly scalable and things like that uh, would be very interesting to get those as plugins for uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift. Yeah. And, and Ivan just threw out a, uh, a URL to a YouTube video that Kubernetes already has some visualization tools. So we'll might take a look at that as well and try and get some of the Kubernetes team to demo that for us. So again, thank you very much, Abhishek, for your time today. And now everybody go back to work and get B B3 out the door. All right. Uh -huh. Take care, guys. Thanks again.